Hi hey folks, welcome back. Uh, this is the cha uh, lecture on chapter 2 of the Thabit game criticism book. And in this chapter I'll give an overview of how the uh, criticism will work. And in the lecture to follow this I'm going to uh, take a close look at Thabit's model essay where he talks about Bioshock and uh, you know, be a little bit more specific about some of these points. But I think this will give you a pretty good idea of what we have in mind by uh, player response criticism. Uh, now, he starts this uh, chapter off, this reading on uh, page 58 here, I have a quote about reader response theory again. Remember, this is the uh, branch of literary theory or literary interpretation that we will be adapting to uh, talk about games. And again, we're talking about Holland. The interpretation of a literary work is subjective and based on the interaction between the reader and the text. While the text triggers the reader's fears, anxieties, desires, fantasies, and defenses, Readers make themselves part of the literary work by transforming, uh, transforming it into a private world and developing an adaptive strategy to cope with the text. So it probably strikes you uh, about this definition or this idea of interpretation, one that is subjective. So we're not claiming here that uh, any game, or for that matter, any work of literature is a sort of one-size-fits-all and every reader will get the same experience from reading it and have the same interpretation of it. That's the, the exact opposite of this approach, a reader response, where we are saying, yes, it's a very subjective thing to interpret a work of literature. And not only that, but uh, it's not, it doesn't so much matter what the author might have intended. We're not trying to figure out what did the author mean in this text? Or what did this game designer have in mind uh, when he or she was designing this level? Not, it's not, that, that's neither here nor there, really, for our purposes, because uh, what we're talking about here is an interaction between the person playing the game or reading the text and that text itself, uh, which in our case, of course, is, is the video game. Uh, so thinking about this, in, again, in terms of a literary work, you know, you can sort of understand where somebody's coming from if they say that uh, a novel is sort of a, it could be, when you read a novel, you're sort of entering into a private world of that novel and you're sort of building this world in collaboration with the author or the text itself, right? So it's sort of metaphorical, whereas, of course, in the game, it's not going to be metaphorical anymore because you will actually be co-narrating it because you get to make all these choices and decisions and all that stuff we've covered already. So basically, the point is, uh, if you think reader response theory makes sense when you're talking about text, traditional printed text, it makes even more sense, it's even obvious, uh, when you're talking about video games. All right, so moving uh, forward then, uh, obviously this is a psychological approach. We've already said that a few times. Uh, he says it uh, defines actually game fiction as a game fiction can be a, quote, computer-mediated psychological experience. I love this. Computer-mediated psychological experience. I mean, what a way to think about a video game. The game story is a personal experience of challenge, and the key to its interpretation is the subjective analysis of the player's response. So, you know, he says, he says it himself. That's the key to the whole ball game, right? The subjective analysis of the player's response. So we're talking about video games as these computer-mediated psychological experiences. And when you have that experience and analyze it, that's basically what we're getting, uh, getting at when we say player response theory. Now, Faber has six questions that he wants us to ask uh, as we're doing this analysis or to to conduct the analysis, I suppose. So well, let's go into those very closely here uh, in the next few slides. So six questions. The first is, what is the challenge the game poses? And so this is important. Again, he says here, the sto uh, this story is a challenging experience in which a fictional world is pre-designed to act against the player who impersonates the protagonist. The challenge is vital to interpretation. Uh, so, some, you know, this, this idea of a game being challenging is, uh, <laughs> that, that itself might be challenged in other uh, video game studies. Uh, there's a question of, you know, if there's no way to lose a game, no way to win a game, is it even a game anymore? I mean, <laughs> doesn't there have to be some way to lose it? Uh, so that's kind of an interesting theoretical or academic question, I guess, that Thaber doesn't really uh, get into here. Uh, but it's pretty clear from the games that we've chosen for this course, there's definitely a way to lose. Uh, Bioshock. Uh, I would say even on the easy difficulty level, you have to learn how to play the game to avoid dying, uh, for example. Uh, so there's all kinds of ways that this world is acting against us, right? Uh, it almost seems like the, uh, 
the game is trying to prevent us from completing it and to getting to uh, the rest of the story. Uh, so we are having to make choices all the time, decisions, learn, and basically overcome these challenges. So for Thoburn, I think it's uh, for you, I'm, I'm sure as well, it's really important to understand, to really look closely at what kind of challenges are being offered, because uh, that will lead into all the other uh, questions. And again, if there's no challenge, uh, is it really even a game? I think that's a fair question. Uh, two, how does the player respond to the challenge? Uh, this is a description of how the player, as the protagonist, acted in the story and track the development of their response and subsequent revisions. So you'll see this when we look at the Bioshock example in the, in the next lecture. But here you're almost, uh, instead of talking about yourself so much, you're thinking about yourself as the character in the story. And basically, this is where I think the creativity comes in. Uh, I was, one of, another reason I like this reader or player response theory is that it has a, a creative element, a little bit, a little bit of a creative writing as well as a critical uh, reflection. I think this is where this comes in. And you can have a lot of fun, I think, uh, retelling the story in this way uh, as the character in the game. So again, think about a psychological ex experience if you were in the shoes of this character. And think about how different that would be than just a generic description of a plot. Now this is, again, a subjective experience. Uh, three, what does the game allow the player to do? Uh, this is uh, the boundaries of a player's influence on events. And again, there's many different kinds of games out there. We'll be covering many in this course that are quite different in terms of the interface, uh, different abilities you might have in some games, different ways to control the game, uh, non-interactive segments that you can't control at all. Uh, all of those elements are what this question is looking at. So how, what does the game actually allow the player to do? Uh, if you think about those uh, books, the Choose Your Own Adventure books, the player only gets to choose among a couple of options, right? In Bioshock, though, it's, uh, I would say, still fairly linear compared to uh, the sort of sandbox games like a Skyrim, right? Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you do have a lot, more, a lot more choices to make, a lot more interactions with that, a lot more power as a co-narrator uh, than you do in those choose-your-own-adventure books, right? Okay, so moving on to question four. How does the player's response reveal his or her identity theme? And this, of course, is the, the crux of the whole thing. This is the, this is the meat of the <laughs> criticism, right? Uh, subjective analysis of your experience. And what we're getting at is what they, this term identity theme, uh, which is a little bit of a technical term, I suppose, but let's look at the next part of this uh, quotation. In what ways and to what extent does the player's own worldview value system, personality orientations, psychological needs, fears, desires, defense mechanisms, and coping strategies affect the story and manage to be uncovered by the story. So we've got a, a sort of a two-pronged attack here. One, so how does your personality, all the stuff going on within you as you play the games, how does that affect the story that you're telling, right, when you go back to analyze it? Uh, but also, what can you uncover by doing this? So you might be aware of some of these uh, identity themes, right? Uh, your worldview, maybe, or things that you value. But maybe you don't know the whole story. And when you go back and reflect on those decisions you were making in the game, you might actually learn, oh, I didn't know I had that. <laughs> I guess that must be a deep-seated fear of mine, let's say. Or I wonder why I chose this course of action must have something to do with a psychological need that I have, or uh, maybe this is just the way I look at the world, I think that was the best choice. So you, this one thing about this criticism, and well, the, the value of it really, is that you can learn not just about this uh, fiction, fictional story, right, but about yourself. Some aspects of your personality that might have been un, <laughs> hidden from view, you weren't even aware that you had these until you, until you did this uh, uh, analysis. So. <laughs> you know, wow. Uh, all right, so moving on to the fifth question. How does the game respond to my actions? Uh, so this, to me, is a lot, is a similar in, to, uh, to the third question. Remember that was, uh, what does the game allow the player to do? Uh, now we're asking, uh, how does the game respond to my actions? So it's a little bit, instead of thinking about what can you do, are you thinking about... Uh, no. What, what, what do you, how did the game, <laughs> let me just back up a little bit. 
All right, so remember when he was talking about the game composition device, uh, the GCD, you know, how you can sort of take your hands off the controls and all this stuff is still going on, and how uh, that's the game part of it, the GCD, but it's, that's just the co-narrator. Uh, so you're sort of uh, co-narrating with that GCD, so all the stuff that happens automatically uh, versus the input that you have as you play the game. So uh, we want to know more about how does this co-narration work, because it will differ in uh, different kinds of games, right? So if you think again about those choose your own adventure books, uh, you can make a cho you can make choices about which page to turn to, right? Uh, but the uh, the GCD would always, in that case, respond the same way, right? You know, every time you turn to page 12, it's going to be the same thing on page 12, <laughs> no matter how many times you turn you turn to that page. Uh, versus games like Bioshock, where I think there's a lot more interesting ways that the GCD can respond to your decisions, right? So I guess, again, instead of thinking, question number three was, uh, what does the game allow the player to do? So the fifth is, what did you do, and how did the, or how did the uh, game respond to what you did? So just one more time, for clarity's sake, maybe for my own. Uh, so third, what does the game allow you to do? Okay, so what does it allow you to do? And the fifth one is, how did the game respond to what you did? Does that make, start to make sense to you? Uh, okay, so how does the co-narration work between the player and the GCD? How does the GCD respond to the player's actions and what can the player learn from this response? And then finally, question number six is uh, how does replaying the game affect the player's interpretation? So uh, we talked a little bit about this uh, before, but if you play a game like Bioshock, for the first time, especially if you're new to the genre of a first-person shooter games, uh, there could be quite a bit of a learning curve. And then there's also uh, the particular world of the game. I mean, Bioshock is pretty unique, I think. It's not similar to uh, a lot of other first-person shooters. I mean, think about how different it is from, I will say, uh, Call of Duty series or even a Doom or, or games like this, even though those are it's basically in the same category, right? Uh, so there's a lot of stuff to learn about the story world, this, this world that we talked about. So when you first few times, maybe even the first few times that you play it, uh, you're still um, sort of learning about all this stuff. You're getting used to it, I would say, familiar with it. And next time you play it, or if you play it again, you'll probably pick up on different things. Uh, you might play it in a different way, uh, make different decisions. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities there. And you know, I, I think this is uh, the value of a game. And, Yes, it's always going to be different, uh, so you can make all these different choices. You know, about like uh, Bioshock, for example, uh, you have all those ways to customize your character. So would you choose the same options every time? Or you might want to choose, maybe you learned, uh, you know, I really didn't have much luck with this particular weapon, or I had more, I had more fun, or I didn't even really get into the whole, uh, what is it, the, uh, the plastids or whatever. So maybe I'll really delve into that part next time I play. And that would affect the interpretation, right? All right, so reproducing the gameplay experience. So this is when we sit down to write our essays. Now this is the uh, the first part, reproducing this gameplay experience. So uh, let me uh, just read this, and then we'll reflect on it. So retelling in our player response model functions as an incubator for critical reflection. Players it allows uh, players to trace and organize the elements of the experience and their own responses so as to account for the meaning-making process that he or she has been involved in. And then we can use it to help analyze other interpretations of that story or uh, other, other games, I suppose. So other interpretations of the story, maybe from your classmates, right? Or uh, just other games. So this is a, to have something to analyze, remember the game is, it's going on a simultaneous co-narration, and you can't really analyze as you're playing it, you know, that would be uh, very difficult to do. So what we want to do instead is, you know, after you've played the game, sit down and write about what happened, and that will be reproducing the gameplay experience. And then later we'll have that to analyze and start delving into identity themes and hopefully uncovering things you may not have been aware of. All right, so that's the basics of it, those six questions. Uh, I hope that was uh, clear enough to you. Uh, I will have another follow I'll have a follow-up lecture to this one where we'll look at the sample essay in the book about Bioshock. 
Uh, but again, let me know if you have any questions or comments about this, the material we've covered here, happy to answer those. And see you next time.